Uh, my friends, our first scripture reading this morning is going to come from John 8, uh, verses 31 through 47. Jesus here is talking to the crowds, especially a crowd of Pharisees. So if you want to turn to John 8 in your Bibles, we will pick up in John 8, verse 31 where Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God? This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, We were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you not, do not hear them is that you are not of God. Sort of a dark passage. Now we turn to Exodus 20. So turn over to Exodus 20 in the Old Testament, where we are, as Pastor Mike said, continuing our look at the Ten Commandments and seeing each and every week that these commandments are a gift to freed people living free. And so each week we read all of the commandments because the commandments are all related. They build on each other. Uh, and at the end of the day, they're all rooted in the very beginning. Uh, those verses we read in our catechism, our relationship with God, a holy God who wants us to be free. And so today, we'll take a look in depth at the ninth commandment after we read Exodus 20, starting in verse 1. The words of the prophet Moses. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity on the father, of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant, or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day 
and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me, friends. Father of truth, set us free this morning. Lord Jesus, free us to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Holy Spirit, free us from the shame and guilt and weight of lies. And free us from the father of lies who seeks to deceive us. And free us to love our neighbor as ourselves. Show us the truth that we may be convicted of our sins of deceit, but that we may also know the beauty of your love. Show us more deeply. Show some of us for the first time the truth of your glorious love, which lifts burdens and sets us free in Christ. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wherever you are, you may be seated. So in 1955, Emmett Till of Chicago was in Mississippi on vacation when he had an interaction with Mrs. Carolyn Donham that was not acceptable in the South at that time. You see, Emmett Till was black, and Mrs. Donham was white. Now, we don't know exactly what interaction happened, because it later turned out that what was originally reported was not true. You see, at the time, Mrs. Donham exaggerated whatever it was that happened and said that Mr. Till had wolf-whistled, used vulgar language, and even grabbed her around the waist. And two men heard of this and executed their idea of justice and killed him for those alleged actions. But years later, Mrs. Donham admitted her claims were not true. She had exaggerated what had happened, and he did not deserve what came to him. But it didn't matter at that point. The lie got Emmett Till killed. Pastor Kevin DeYoung says God cares deeply about verbal justice. He quotes the old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And he says that just isn't true. Words can kill. It is ironic that on the day we talk about the ninth commandment, I'm talking to people mostly on Facebook. There are six of us in this room. But my friends, our moment in time is ripe for a need to hear the ninth commandment. And things like with Emmett Till or what goes on in our daily lives is why the ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, is so important. Lies kill, whether lies told in court or lies shared in other ways. Because lies not only literally kill, but they can destroy our lives, ravage our reputations, ruin our relationships, and run aground our societies. My friends, satanic slander spoils society and souls. So let's take a look at what that means. Satanic slander spoils society and souls. First, what do I even mean by satanic? Uh, We read over in our John 8 passage where Jesus said in John 8, Satan was a murderer from the beginning and does not, uh, was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. So Jesus is, is actually saying that lies come from Satan. Now, I know for some of my more skeptical friends watching today, when I start talking about Satan, that can bring up a lot of doubts for you. And I would love to grab coffee and just talk about that. But I just want to suggest to you that Kevin Spacey was right in The Unusual Suspects when he said, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. If there is a God, then it is at least possible there's also a devil. And Jesus says without reservation that there is. And if we read through the Bible, we discover that Satan is actually the one who started the corruption of our world. Every bit of sin and sickness 
in our world started with a lie. Casting doubt on God's good name uh, when he said to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, is that really what God said? And humanity sinned. And Satan has been lying about God and people ever since. In fact, the word Satan, Hebrew hasatan, really isn't even a proper name at all. But it's a word commonly translated the adversary. But it can also rightly be translated the accuser or the slanderer. This is what Satan does, and it's what Satan tempts us toward. He's constantly trying to draw us in to doubt God's good name and to slander one another, to have dishonesty in our lives. Because when we lie, when we slander and disparage others' good name, all of these things are satanic and evil. And so Jesus can go so far as to say in Matthew 15, 19, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. When Satan is our father, as Jesus said was true of these people in the crowd, when Satan gets in our heads, when our hearts turn away from God, falsehoods flow from every sin we commit. But let's break down falsehood even more, because it's bigger than just a lie, although it does start with that. In fact, let's just take the basic meaning of a lie. What does the Ninth Commandment teach us? All right, kids at home, Abigail, Jerem, you're paying attention, right? You, you, you have to fill in the blank here. What does the Ninth Commandment teach us? The Ninth Commandment teaches us to tell the truth and not to lie. To tell the truth and not to lie. But what is a lie? Now, I want to encourage everyone watching to, to Google, not right now, since you can do that right now, <laughs> Google later the Westminster Larger Catechism and bring up questions 144 and 145. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I just want to break down a few pertinent parts for us. Uh, if you read it, you'll see that according to this catechism, and it's probably got lots of scripture proofs to prove it, the Ninth Commandment forbids everything detrimental to the truth and the good reputation or good name of others as well as our own. And, and now, this is especially pertinent in legal or court matters, that is where the commandment starts, that we should tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in court. But... The Ninth Commandment includes much more. Things like boastful exaggeration, forgery, speaking untruth, lying, slandering. And here's where it gets convicting for me, where I fail. Backbiting, detracting, belittling, gossiping, scoffing, ridiculing, reviling, Rash, harsh, and partial censuring. That, that's expressing any kind of judgmental opinion that is rash, harsh, and prejudiced. And next, where our media, frankly, often fails, and where we fail in sharing it, misconstruing intentions, words, and actions, otherwise known as impugning motives. That is, if you claim to know why someone did such and such, such, and such saying, well, they're just whatever, they're trying to sabotage them because they were appointed by so-and-so. Especially if you turn, to be, turn out to be wrong about who appointed so-and-so. If you claim to know someone's motives and they didn't say that was their motive, you are breaking the ninth commandment. You're smearing their good name without cause. You cannot see people's hearts. That's for God. And we must not impugn motives. It is sin. But what's more the Ninth Commandment forbids even talking bad about others when you don't have to, right? Which is something we like to do all the time. This is why Paul writes, uh, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Speak evil of no one, avoid quarreling, be gentle, and show perfect courtesy toward all people. This means not just straight-up falsehoods, but even truths, 
used in a way intended to hurt others maliciously or to mar their good name is sin. To return to the catechism, it is sin to deny the gifts and graces of God that others have, even if you don't like them. It is sin to aggravate smaller faults. In other words, well, I don't like their opinion about this, so I'm going to bring up their failure in this other area to prove why we shouldn't listen to them about this. That's a logical fallacy called whataboutism. Bringing up where they were wrong somewhere else is not necessarily pertinent to what they're speaking about now. Further, it is sin to go unnecessarily looking for people's faults, to raise rumors, or even to receive and approve of something said about another that paints them in a bad light unnecessarily. Why is all of this sin? Because constant trying to shame others, to smear the good name of anything we feel like, breaks down our society. Constantly looking for what's wrong with people so that we can share it and be in the know may, recedes trust and lets suspicion prevail. And it will bring us down. Now, some of you may be thinking, now, wait a minute, didn't Jesus call some people out, like in John 8? Well, yeah, he did. But first of all, he was a prophet and had the omnipotence of God. Are you saying you're a prophet with the omnipotence of God? But second, he did actually instruct us about how to call others out. In Matthew 7, 1 through 5, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, Judge not that you not be judged. That's not saying you don't actually judge. He goes on. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye, when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. God have mercy on me, a sinner. That's why Proverbs 25, 9 and 10 says, Argue your case with your neighbor himself and do not reveal another's secrets, lest he who hears you bring shame upon you and your ill repute have no end. Oh, the stories of someone that brought someone else down only later to be brought down by the same thing. We are not to use the truth against someone else publicly and bring down their good name when we can do it privately. That's why in Matthew 18, Jesus instructs us that when we see our brother sinning, we aren't to go posting it on blogs and sharing it on Twitter and airing it on TV. What, is that what he said? No. He said, go and tell your brother his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. And only if he doesn't listen do we then open it up to the wider world, and even then still keeping it as private as possible. But why is it so important that we keep the Ninth Commandment this way? What do lies and slander and malicious words do? They spoil society and souls. What do I mean by spoil? As one commentator put it, truth-telling is a cornerstone of a healthy community. If all we're focused on is tearing each other down because we disagree about things, we will have no community. If we let lies and slander and name-calling run rampant, it will destroy our relationships and our ability to even be neighbors, and it will destroy our individual selves. So what should we do? What should we do to heal and maintain our society? Well, let me make this personal to you. Republicans are nothing but greedy white people who do not care for the poor. And Democrats are nothing but lazy socialists who don't believe in working. Now, if you're offended, that's because I just lied about you. I just told two lies 
That's not true of Republicans, and that's not true of Democrats, and we need to stop making Facebook posts that suggest it is. We need to stop making statements like that in any context. And we Christians are the worst. And friends, I'm, I'm not innocent. I cannot tell you how much scrubbing of my Facebook I've had to do because of the number of times I've impugned people's motives, posted things that weren't true, and just realized I was wrong later. It is slander to do those sorts of things, and we must stop. When we make blanket statements about parties, politicians, and people, it is unfair and slanderous. Because assuming I know why someone is doing what they're doing is assuming I know everything. It's putting myself in the place of God. And I, we must stop our social media tirades against those people. Because this sort of libel, slander, and vitriol is destroying our society as basic trust of one another erodes. And it's seeping into the church, destroying our denominations and our local churches as people see Christians hating one another on Facebook instead of loving one another. And then it's destroying our souls. Now, I do want to stop and clarify. Some of you may be going right now, oh, so I can't call out anyone that's done anything wrong? That, that's not what I said. I told you how we're supposed to do that. right? I'm not talking about covering up sex scandals in the church. I'm not talking qu about keeping quiet the misdeeds of powerful men who misuse their power. I'm not talking about covering up people's crimes. That is not what I'm talking about. Right? The catechism addresses this too. Uh, when it says that it is forbidden to conceal the truth. Undue silence in a just cause is forbidden. Holding our peace when iniquity calls for either a reproof from ourselves or complaint to others. Also forbidden is excusing or extenuating sins when called to a free confession. There is a proper and appropriate time and way to call someone out, but not the way our call-out culture does it. In court, or for Christians in the courts of the church, we can and should make an honest and frank witness to what we know to be true in gracious ways, starting privately and then appropriately involving the authorities when abuse is happening or when we're not listened to, as Jesus said. To cover up the sorts of scandals that have happened in the church and in the world would be its own form of breaking the Ninth Commandment. But nonetheless, trial by Twitter is sin. Because ultimately, that individual sharing of juicy gossip destroys our souls. It, why do we love scandal and accusation? We say, oh, I don't love them, but then we share them and gossip about them like they're something delicious. Whether it's sex scandals with presidents or uh, posting our, most, our take on the most recent crime making the news, we love to talk about anyone that we can tear down and make of them. Our hearts crave finding ways to feel better than others, and it is killing our souls. But why do we crave this? What is wrong with us? Satan still has an influence on us, even those of us in Christ. And because of our sinful nature, it's part of who we are now, and Satan aggravates it. Anyone who reflects on themselves honestly will admit they resonate with the writer of the Proverbs, who said, the words of juicy gossip are like delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body, giving great pleasure. And that proverb is a warning. And so to fight back against the darkness, to push back against the slander, I want to challenge you with something that will help our hearts. Something I heard Pastor Scott Sauls say a few years back. Here's my challenge to you. For the next 365 days, for the rest of your life, please, for, begin to gossip good. Make a commitment to catch people doing good and share that. Commit to only gossip good news. Did you hear what Pastor Mike did the other day? He helped someone, and he, he gave up himself. 
Did you hear what Moose did for someone the other day? Moose was out there. He wasn't even on the clock, but he was helping someone change their tire. Isn't he amazing? Let's gossip good. And when you see posts or propaganda tearing down people, politicians, and parties, just don't share it. Keep it to what is good. As the Westminster Larger Catechism says over in question 145, we must have a charitable regard for others, loving, desiring, and rejoicing in their good reputation, as well as regretting and putting the best light on their failings. The next time you post about Hillary, and the next time you post about Trump, I hope you do it with regret, or don't do it at all, and put the best light on their failings. Because maybe, maybe, they actually do know something you don't know, or didn't do the thing that you have no evidence they did. We must freely acknowledge others' talents and gifts, defending their innocence, readily receiving a good report about them, readily receiving a good report about them, and only reluctantly admitting a bad one. That's the standards of our church. And I hope you know I'm not just talking about social media. Where have we torn down others over dinner, over phone calls, over conversations in the workplace? Where have we torn down our own spouses, our families, our friends, or just that neighbor we don't like because we disagree with their take on how to handle COVID-19? Where have we talked about something like a fact that we really don't know about? We must repent. My friends, I fear that some may say, but those people talked bad about us. We can't just let them get away with that. That's not fair. Friends, for Christians, when it comes to double standards, Christians always willingly stand on the losing side. We let it hold us higher. And this means if they say mean things, we don't. If the other side gets to do something, but we know it's wrong, we turn the other cheek. And we always use words with truth and integrity and love and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And when we do correct and call out, we do it as Paul instructed in Galatians 6, 1 through 3. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. So I'm not talking about being a rug. There are appropriate ways to seek justice, but not through vigilante gossip. Nonetheless, sometimes when we refuse to fight fire with fire, we'll seem weak. But you know what God said to Paul when Paul said he felt weak? My grace is sufficient for you. And my power is made perfect in weakness. Maybe by being true and humble, righteousness will overcome the arrogant and slanderous. So, what can actually help us do all this? If you're feeling beat down, I get it. I do too. I got one finger pointed at you, but I got three pointed back at me and one pointed sideways. <laughs> what can help us suffer slander and stand for truth? A warning and an encouragement. We'll end with the encouragement. First, a short warning. A warning from Jesus himself in Matthew 12, 36. I tell you, Jesus said, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak and tweet and share and write and gossip over dinner or the phone. But now the encouragement. What do we do with the myriad of ways we failed? How can I have any hope with what a failure I am personally? How can we find healing for our hearts to, and the motivation to take such abuse and the courage to speak such truth and the humility to be gracious and kind? Yes, even to that person. We turn to the one who says he is the way, the truth, and the life and promises to set us free. We read about him in John 8. My friends, satanic slander spoils society and souls, but Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, will set us free. You see, 
We should care about others' good name because God has cared about ours enough to send the one who is the truth to set us free. Our names are rightly and justly smeared by our own sin, and that's no lie. We have failed to keep God's commandments, this commandment and all the others in a myriad of ways. And Jesus knows that, and yet he will not talk bad about us to his Father. Satan accuses us, but Jesus defends us. So John wrote in 1 John 2, If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. When Jesus died on the cross, he was taking credit for all our sins. Those thoughts, words, and deeds that really should wreck our good name with God. And then he defends our good name with God by telling God we've done every perfect work he ever did. He took took upon himself our sins and gives us his perfect record and defends our good name to his Father in heaven. And so now we have an eternal, everlasting, incorruptible good name with God thanks to our Savior Jesus who loves us and longs to set us free. How much more then ought we to care for others, good names, even our enemies? Love covers a multitude of sins, Peter wrote, to remind us that the love of Jesus Christ has covered all our sins. And so we are enabled by his grace to speak truthfully and gracefully about others. My friends, that is true good news that will set you free and bring healing to our society and our souls. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that there is a truth that we can cling to and trust our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, by your mercy, give us your Holy Spirit to make the church a people of truth and not people of the lie. Convince many of the truth of the gospel, even today, using this live stream. Convince people that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, oh, Holy Spirit, who wants to give them graciously the love of God and eternal life to all who will repent and believe the truth. And help us, O Lord, be gracious in all the words that would come out of our mouths, our fingers, and our thoughts. That everything we would say, write, and share would glorify your name rather than tear others down. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen.